actually worried that when I got up here I wouldn't be able to reach the microphone, so <laughs> I'm so glad I can actually reach it. Um, I just want to thank everyone that's here today. Um, I want to thank you for your hearts for these very important social issues and that you've made the, the effort to come here on a Saturday. Um, and I also want to thank Wendy and Linda. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, well, I mean, what amazing presentations we've seen so far today. It's been amazing. I'm especially touched by Ali Murray's story. Um, thank you for your bravery. Yeah. There's a, there's a word that's been used a lot today, and that's hope. A lot of different people have used the word hope. Melinda was talking this morning about the importance of um, having some hopeful messages when we're talking about such distressing content and issues, you know, such as exploitation. And so that's what I want to talk to you all about today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of uh, giving a voice to survivors and the importance of, of helping survivors to find hope and reasons to live after trauma. So I'd like to share a little bit about um, my background and my story and then I'll get a little bit into how that inspired me to create this particular project called Reasons to Live, which now helps give a voice to people all around the world. So as, um, as Caitlin mentioned briefly when she introduced me, I grew up in a home with family violence. So from a very young age, I was always walking on eggshells. Um, the, the abuse was mental and emotional, although it was physical at times towards my mum. I, for the most part, didn't witness that, but you, you know, as a child, you kind of have a sense of what's going on, and it's incredibly distressing when you feel um, so powerless and you feel that you can't do anything to change a situation. And so I remember from the age of 10, really, being incredibly depressed. And the way I describe that to people is that when I would go to school each day, it felt like there was this invisible person just clawing at my face and just pulling at my face. And that's really the only way I could describe the incredible sense of um, hopelessness and sadness that was living within me. And there were no uh, campaigns back then. We didn't have any family violence campaigns. You couldn't turn on TV and see a message about, um, you know, Australia says no to, to domestic violence. There was no Me Too movements. There was nothing like that. Um, we also lived in uh, a tiny little valley, so we, you know, a apart from when I went to school, um, I didn't really have uh, any, any interaction with anyone else. So I know that I felt incredibly alone for most of my life, and that uh, manifested and, and really deepened the older I got and the further I went throughout my teenage years, to the point where by the time I was 17, 18, finishing school, I felt like my nose was just above the waterline. I felt like I was drowning and I was incredibly suicidal. And this was where my dad's mental and emotional abuse started to get a lot worse. During this time, we had to move out of home for six months to a safe house. And I remember just being terrified that my dad was going to find where we were. And it was, it was just pretty awful. And just after I finished year 12, I remember thinking, um, you know, I've, I've survived, I've finished school, um, you know, I've done it. Uh, but then it was this sort of fear around becoming an adult and not knowing what was next and not, what, what was I going to do with my life and how was I going to escape my dad's constant abuse. Um, you know, at this time, he, he would constantly tell me how worthless I was. Um, he was... He would uh, control where we went. He'd do things like hiding the car keys. Uh, we only had one car, so that controlled when my mum could take us out. When she could go out, she was constantly being questions, questioned and accused of having an affair. And my dad was constantly telling me how you know stupid I was and worthless I was. And um, it was just after I finished high school when I was just sort of trying to hold on that little bit longer that he actually took his life. And I think even today that's um, one of the hardest things for me to speak about because when people talk about suicide prevention um, or they talk about losing someone to suicide, you always hear about the devastation of losing someone, but nobody often talks about what it's like when 
you lose a parent and you, or you lose someone and you sim simultaneously feel these feelings of devastation and relief because for the first time in you know, over a decade, you feel safe, you feel free. And so that created so much, so many more layers of trauma in my life. So now I had to deal with years, you know, a decade worth of mental and emotional abuse from my dad. I had his suicide to deal with. Um, and then so I went out into the world as a, a very, you know, damaged, emotionally damaged young woman. Didn't know how to set boundaries for myself for the most part. Didn't know how to stand up for myself. Um, like MTR was saying, I was one of those young women that was like, oh, I don't want to hurt his feelings. How do I say no to doing this thing that I don't really want to do because I might hurt his feelings? So I went into relationships with men who were, um, you know, some of them for the most part, they were nice, but, you know, they were watching porn even back then. We just, you know, transcended from dial up to, um, you know, where we, where we are now. And so, um, yeah, I was dating guys who really didn't have my best interests at heart. That led to a sexual assault from a guy that I dated. And, you know, to cut a long story short, I had to um, make a decision to turn my life around and to, to claw myself, claw my way out of this black hole that I'd basically gotten into. Um, and so many, many years passed and I started to, you know, do better at life and I started to find my voice, which is uh, one thing that Ali Murray said so beautifully was when you talked about finding your voice and being a voice. And I think for me, I really started thriving when I learned how to, or when I gave myself the, the permission and found the courage to start having a voice about different issues and things that I'd experienced and speaking out about them. And so, um, you know, it was around maybe a decade ago when I began to sort of talk out about issues like human trafficking and child abuse and um, domestic violence. And as the years have gone on, I've found that, you know, each of these issues is, you know, when, when, you, when you talk about suicide prevention or you're talking about mental health, health issues, all of these issues are intertwined. Every single, um, you know, social issue or trauma that I have advocated on over the years or spoken to people about, um, they're all intertwined with mental illness and suicide prevention. And I think that's why suicide prevention has become a very important focus of mine over the past few years. Um, you know, tying in as well with my personal experience on the issue. And so it was a couple of years ago after I finished co-founding Brisbane's first domestic violence memorial, I started thinking about what I could do to address, um, you know, this growing epidemic of suicide in our country. And that led me to sort of think about my own life and how far I'd come and um, you know how devastating it is that so many people in our communities don't feel that they have the, the resilience or the strength to keep going. And I thought, you know, I feel like I survived all of these things for a reason and I feel like I don't want that to go to waste. And that was a really pivotal moment for me a couple of years ago and that really inspired me to start um, the creation of this project which became a book series called Reasons to Live One More Day Every Day. So I don't have any fancy slides but um, it became, yeah, this, this book which is a collection of 10 um, stories from around Australia from different individuals, high profile individuals, everyday individuals who have found a way to overcome trauma, mental illness, people who survived suicide, um, lots of different, you know, backgrounds. I spoke to people from, you know, small Aboriginal communities in Western Australia like Leonora through to, um, you know, globally renowned hip hop artists like El Fresh the Lion. I spoke to um, incredibly courageous women like Sonia Anderson, who's very well known here in Brisbane. Uh, she lost her daughter Bianca to homicide several years ago, domestic homicide. And the, the key thing that I found with each of these people that I spoke to was, you know, the, the process of finding hope and how important hope is and, and how important it is to cling on to that when we are in these, you know, dark black holes. And the other thing I discovered was that 
each of these people, whether they were a survivor of, you know, domestic violence or child abuse or whatever it may be, they all talked about how healing it was to be validated in their story. They talked about how important it was to have somebody that would hold space for them and listen to their story and listen with empathy. Um, you know, it's it's so important and it's and it's something I understand myself. But um, you know, people can often feel scared about talking about issues that are so confronting, like the ones we've heard of today. But you don't always have to know the exact right words to say to someone who's struggling, whatever the trauma is that they have experienced. Sometimes you just need to be there to listen. You know, like Daniel was talking earlier about empathy. You know, we need to have empathy for the things that people go through in their lives. And that's really why I created this project because I wanted to help give a platform and a voice to people who um, have survived some very difficult things and you know, have made it out the other side because I think that these voices are incredibly important for people to hear. Um, and, you know, I know I don't have much time today, but just to share with you very quickly a personal story of um, a woman who I've just finished working with for the second volume of my book series. She's a woman who's in her 60s and she, she experienced severe exploitation as a child. She was exploited from the age of three months old until she was 15. And the only reason it stopped at age 15 was because he decided that she was no longer needed for his desires anymore. And she was sent away to a school in the city. So you can only try to imagine how that felt for her. Um, you know, we worked together over the last year on her story to put her story together and put it into this, you know, second volume of Reasons to Live. And she said to me, like, it's so, I feel like I'm getting my life back like I'm in, in my 60s and I feel like I'm finally breaking free and becoming myself and able to, you know, start pushing towards my goals and living my dreams. And for her, it just highlights so clearly to me the importance of giving a voice to survivors and for them to have um, a sense that, you know, there's, there's someone that they can go to. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, you know, my focus of my work and my, um, you know, my projects as a writing coach is really to give a voice to people who have made it through some really, really hard things and now have a lot of wisdom and insight to share with, with others and help them out of that hole as well. So, um, yeah, it's an honor to share a little bit today. And, um, if you'd like to know more about my work or have a chat, please, um, come see me during the break. So, Thanks so much, Jazz, for meeting some amazing people and hearing some amazing stories. Um, please do visit Jazz at her table. Um, she's another one who would be really happy to come to your group uh, to speak. It's just so uh, good for us to know if these people are available. Um, I was at the unveiling of the Domestic Violence Memorial. It was open to the public to go and, and see it when it was actually unveiled. And it was a really moving experience. And it's a beautiful memorial. I wish it was closer to where we are now, but it's sort of on the other side of our CBD. Uh, but if you're staying around in Brisbane at all, it's really worth the walk. It's in a beautiful park. It's near the Rome Street Park fence. Um, and Jazz can show, tell you where it is to find, but it's a really beautiful um, memorial. 